Chapter fourteen of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter fourteen. A Crisis with Bud. Ralph sat still at his desk. The school had gone. All at once he became conscious that Shocky sat yet in his accustomed place upon the hard, backless bench. Why, Shocky, haven't you gone yet? No, sir. I was waitin' to see if you warn't a goin' too. I— Well? I thought it would make me feel as if God warn't quite so fur away to talk to you. It did the other day. The master rose and put his hand on Shocky's head. Was it the brotherhood in affliction that made Shocky's words choke him so? Or was it the weird thoughts that he expressed? Or was it the recollection that Shocky was Hannah's brother? Hannah so far, far away from him now. At any rate, Shocky, looking up for the smile on which he fed, saw the relaxing of the master's face that had been as hard as stone, and felt just one hot tear on his hand. "'Perhaps God's forgot you, too,' said Shocky, in a sort of half-soliloquy. "'Better get away from Flat Creek. You see, God forgets everybody down here. "'Cause most everybody forgets God, except Mr. Bosaw, and I allow God don't know ways cure to be remembered by sich as him. Leastways I wouldn't if I was God, you know. I wonder what becomes of folks when God forgets em. And Shocky, seeing that the master had resumed his seat, and was looking absently into the fire, moved slowly out the door. Shocky, called the master. The little poet came back and stood before him. Shocky, you mustn't think God has forgotten you. God brings things out right at last. But Ralph's own faith was weak, and his words sounded hollow and hypocritical to himself. Would God indeed bring things out right? He sat musing a good while, trying to convince himself of the truth of what he had just been saying to Shocky, that God would indeed bring things out right at last. Would it all come out right if Bud married Hannah? Would it all come out right if he were driven from Flat Creek with a dark suspicion upon his character? Did God concern himself with these things? Was there any God? It was the same old struggle between doubt and faith. And when Ralph looked up, Shocky had departed. In the next hour, Ralph fought the old battle of Armageddon. I shall not describe it. You will fight it in your own way. No two alike. The important thing is the end. If you come out as he did, with the doubt gone and the trust in God victorious, it matters little just what shape the battle may take. Since Jacob became Israel, there have never been two such struggles alike, save in that they all end either in victory or in defeat. It was after twelve o'clock on that Christmas day when Ralph put his head out the door of the schoolhouse and called out, "'Bud, I'd like to see you.' Bud did not care to see the master, for he had inly resolved to thrash him and have done with him. But he couldn't back out certainly not in sight of the others who were passing along the road with him. "'I don't want the rest of you,' said Rolf, in a decided way, as he saw that Hank and one or two others were resolved to come also. "'I thought maybe you'd want somebody to see far play,' said Hank, as he went off sheepishly. "'If I did, you would be the last one I should ask,' said Rolf. "'There's no unfair play in Bud, and there is in you.' And he shook the door. "'Now looky here, Mr. Ralph Hartsook,' said Bud. "'You don't come no gum games over me with your saft solder and all that. "'I've made up my mind. "'You've got to promise to leave these ere diggin', or I've got to thrash you.' "'You'll have to thrash me, then,' said Ralph, turning a little pale, but remembering the bulldog. "'But you'll tell me what it's all about, won't you?' "'You know well enough. "'Folks say you know more about the robbery at the Dutchman's than you order. "'But I don't believe them.' For them as says it is liars and thieves theirselves. Taint for none of that, and I shan't tell you what it is for. So now, if you won't travel, why, take off your coat and get ready for a thrashing. The master took off his coat and showed his slender arms. Bud laid off his and showed the physique of a prize fighter. You ain't a-goin' to fight me, said Bud. Not unless you make me. Why, I could chaw you all up. I know that. Well, you're the grittiest feller I ever did see, and if you'd just kep off of my ground, I wouldn't a touched you. 
but I ain't a goin' to be cut out by no feller a livin' thout thrashin' him in an inch of his life. You see, I wanted to get out of this flat crick way. We're a low-lived set here in flat crick, and I says to myself, I'll try to be something more nor Pete Jones and Dad and these other triflin' good for nothin' ones bout here. And when you come, I says, there's one as'll help me. And what do you do with your book larnin' and town manners? But start right out to get away the gale that I'd picked out, when I'd picked her out case I thought, not bein' flat crick born herself, she might help a feller to do better. Now I won't let nobody cut me out without givin' em the best thrashin' it's in these air arms to give. But I haven't tried to cut you out. You can't fool me. Bud, listen to me, and then thrash me if you will. I went with that girl once. When I found you had some claims, I gave her up. Not because I was afraid of you, for I would rather have taken the worst thrashing you can give me than give her up. But I haven't spoken to her since the night of the first spelling school. You lie, said Bud, doubling his fists. Ralph grew red. You was a waitin' on her last Sunday right afore my eyes, and a tryin' to catch my attention, too. So when you're ready, say so. Bud, there is some misunderstanding. Hartsick spoke slowly and felt bewildered. I tell you that I did not speak to Hannah last Sunday, and you know I didn't. Hannah! Bud's eyes grew large. Hannah! Here he gasped for breath and looked around. Hannah! He couldn't get any further than the name at first. Why, plague take it! Who said Hannah? Mirandy said you were courting Hannah, said Rolf feeling round in a vague way to get his ideas together. Mirandy! Thunder! You believed Mirandy! Well, now, looky here, Mr. Hartsook, if you was to say that my sister lied, I'd lick you till your hide wouldn't hold shucks. But I say, atwixt you and me and the gatepost, don't you never believe nothing that Mirandy means says. Her and Marm has set themselves like fools to get you. Hannah! Well, she's a mighty nice gal, but you're welcome to her. I never tuck no shine that airway. But I was out of school last Thursday and Friday, a shuckin' corn to take to the mill a Saturday, and when I come past the squires and seed you talkin' to a gal, as is a gal, you know. Here Bud hesitated and looked foolish. I felt hoppin' mad. Bud put on his coat. Rolf put on his coat. Then they shook hands and Bud went out. Rolf sat looking into the fire. There was no conscientious difficulty now in the way of his claiming Hannah. The dry four-stick lying on the rude stone andirons burst into a blaze. The smoldering hope in the heart of Rolf Hartsook did the same. He could have Hannah if he could win her. But there came slowly back the recollection of his lost standing in Flat Creek. There was circumstantial evidence against him. It was evident that Hannah believed something of this. What other stones Small might have put in circulation he did not know. Would Small try to win Hannah's love to throw it away again, as he had done with others? At least he would not spare any pains to turn the heart of the bound girl against Rolf. The bright flame on the forestick, which Rolf had been watching, flickered and burned low. End of chapter 14